We're live. Good day and good evening to everyone here to offer a tribute to a poet of immense consequence, influence, integrity, grit, craft, a voice of her time and time immemorial. I am, of course, speaking of Ivan Boland. I'm Sandy Yunon, your host for today's tribute to Ivan Boland here with Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And joining us today will be four women who knew Ivan personally and professionally in various capacities. Before I introduce each of our special guests, a little more about Ivan Boland. She was born on September 24th, 1944 in Dublin. And at the time of her passing was the Bella Mabry and Eloise Mabry Knapp Professor in the Humanities, the Melvin and Bill Lane Professor of English and the Director of the Creative Writing Program at Stanford University. She had just completed in December, 2019, her term as editor of Poetry Ireland Review. And in between, in between, she was among other things, the co-collaborator of two texts on craft, the author of two extraordinary nonfiction books and of 10 collections of poetry, including her most recent published posthumously, The Historians. Please do look up her titles and we will be having links in our chat here for you. Well, I had the opportunity to meet Yvonne Boland once after a reading she gave with Paul Muldoon in the late 80s at the austere St. Paul's Church on the edge of Harvard University's campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I say opportunity because honestly, when I was in my mid twenties and I was too in awe of the poetry I had just heard to even walk up my book. I do still feel that same awe that I felt that day every time I pick up one of her books or any time I listen to her on one of the many recordings we have preserved of her readings, which truth be told, I do often. Boland punctuates each phrase with the weight of made meaning and the meaning of weighty history, both the marks of a beyond gifted poet and one who doesn't just make history, but changes the course of it. And I remember this April day last year, vividly, I was stranded in Missoula, Montana in the early weeks of the pandemic, learning to work virtually from my new office, my computer in a bedroom in my friend's mother's house. There was a knock on my bedroom door and my friend interrupted to let me know that I might wanna check my social media feed because some Irish poet had died. Who I asked and she didn't remember. Well, when I saw it was Ivan Boland, I, I burst into tears. And my friend understood instantly that Ivan Boland was not just some Irish poet. For many, including some of us in this virtual space today and those watching this recording later, Ivan Boland is and will always be the poet that brought Ireland into the 20th century by writing poems that chronicle how our future will become the past of other women. The title of the final poem in her final collection, The Historians. In that moment of learning of her death in the early weeks of the pandemic, I immediately felt that I was living inside the opening lines of quarantine. That I was indeed alive in the worst hour of the worst season, of the worst year, of a whole people, with people whom I knew across the pond who would be just 
feeling her death so profoundly when they most needed the voice of one of their most significant artists. It was during Poetry Month and it was just two days away from Poetry Day Ireland. But the death of a poet of consequence and conscience never produces silence, does it? On that April day last year, in the worst hour of the worst season of what may remain the worst year of a whole world, my friend and I drove down to the University of Montana, stood by the historical marker of Jeanette Rankin, a Montana politician and a suffragist, and recorded me reading this poem of Evan Bolin's from her collection, The Lost Land. This is a habitable grief. Long ago, I was a child in a strange country. I was Irish in England. I learned a second language there, which has stood me in good stead. The lingua franca of a lost land, a dialect in which what has never been could still be found, that infinite horizon, always far and impossible, that contrary passion to be whole. This is what language is, a habitable grief, a turn of speech for the everyday and ordinary abrasion of losses such as this, which hurts just enough to be a scar and heals just enough to be a nation. Well, now it is my immense honor to honor four women poets who Boland's genuine commitment to expanding Irish literature to include the voices of women influenced. Catherine Ann Cullen, inaugural poet in residence of Poetry Ireland, Jesse Lendeni, founder and managing editor of Salmon Poetry, celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Rachel Haggerty, poet of Salmon Poetry Extraordinaire, and Nessa Mahoney, the, among other things, the editor of Ivan Boland, Inside History. I will introduce each individually after um, after their offerings, and we will invite you to read a poem of Ivan's in the open mic after those offerings. As please private message uh, Kim Ports Parsons if you care to read in the open mic. Well, first is Catherine and Cullen, who before I uh, share the more formal biography, I just want to say was fabulous in our Laureate Love Fest in February. So I'm very happy to have her returning with us. Catherine Ann Cullen is the inaugural poet in residence at Poetry Ireland and a prize winning poet, songwriter and children's writer. She was awarded a Kavanaugh Fellowship in 2018. Her poem, Triskel was shortlisted for Irish Poem of the Year in 2020, and she has published three collections, including The Other Now, New and Selected Poems from Daedalus 2016, and three children's books, including a reimagining of a Latvian book, All Better, from Little Island from 2019. Her fourth collection, a lozenge of yellow glass is due from Daedalus in 2021, later this year. She has a PhD in creative writing and is a scholar of broadside ballads. Would you please welcome Catherine Ann Cullen. Thank you so much, Sandy. I hope you can hear me okay. You can hear me, that's good. Uh, so it's lovely to be here with such a wonderful collection of women and thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody. Um, just thinking of this time last year, it was such a shock to everybody. I mean, I, I have to mention Evan's family also, um, I'm thinking of them this evening. 
it was such a shock to everyone in the poetry world and I think she's coming right back, folks. That's better as time went on. I had, um, can you hear me okay? All right. <laughs> um, I was looking forward to getting to know Ivan a little bit better as time went on. I'd met her over the years at launches, including the launch of Ness's uh, wonderful collection of uh, about Ivan. And um, I uh, had been lucky enough to spend some time with her in the kitchen of Poetry Ireland um, just at that uh, Christmas of 2019 um, when the uh, her last uh, edition of Poetry Ireland Review came out. Um, she was so funny, she was so, so sharp and smart, and she was also really warm and kind. And um, as I said, I was looking forward to getting to know her better over the time. And um, now the only thing I can do to get, her know, to get to know her better is to look at her work. And I'm more conscious now of looking for the Ivan who I glimpsed in those last years of her life, as it turned out. Um, I, I, I want to look at them in her poems now. And this evening, I just want to use as many of Ivan's words as I can. And I want to open with a poem of hers, Atlantis, A Lost Sonnet, from her 2007 collection, Domestic Violence. Uh, I'm reading this for two reasons. Um, it fits in with this year's Poetry Day Ireland theme of new directions, maps, and journeys. So it's one of the pocket poems that are published online this year for the occasion. You'll find it on poetryireland.ie. Um, but it also has the unmistakable voice of a van. It's conversational, and I'll come back to that word later. Um, it's also wry, it's quintessentially Dublin, and it's crystal clear. Atlantis, a lost sonnet. How on earth did it happen, I used to wonder, that a whole city, arches, pillars, colonnades, not to mention vehicles and animals, had, had all one fine day gone under. I mean, I said to myself, the world was small then. Surely a great city must have been missed. I miss our old city, white pepper, white pudding, you and I meeting under fan lights and low skies to go home in it. Maybe what really happened is this. The old fable makers searched hard for a word to convey that what is gone is gone forever and never found it. And so in the best traditions of where we come from, they gave their sorrow a name and drowned it. So I love that poem. Um, Yvonne edited Poetry Ireland Review uh, from issue 121 to issue 129 from May 2016 to December 2019. That's three issues a year for three years. That's quite a lot. All her issues, by the way, were um, specially expanded issues. Um, they were above normal size because, because of the volumes of submissions that came in because Ivan was editor. I think that is a real tribute to her. Um, I never heard of an editor who was so interested in the cover notes that people put with their um, poems that they sent in. And maybe that was because um, she was away from Ireland for such a lot of the time and for so long working at Stanford. And the personal testimony of people, mostly from Ireland in that cover note, kept her in touch with what was going on there and with what poetry was being written there. Um, and her issues also had quite a high uh, proportion uh, of older poets, uh, as well as uh, obviously some younger poets. But I think the stories of those older poets writing in uh, talking about maybe their younger selves in in Dublin um, or in Ireland overlapped with Ivan's own experience as a younger poet when she was teaching and writing in Ireland and before she moved to Stanford. Um, 
She was very, very generous to people with her time in Poetry Ireland and very inclusive in the choices she made uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the journal. And she was, as I said, very, very interested in those letters and in how people came to writing. Um, she was interested in why they had come to sending their poems to Poetry Ireland Review and specifically to her. And that was as important to her as whether they had a publishing record or any kind of history uh, in uh, any kind of fame. Um, so her issues of the journal were very democratic. So, you know, a, a famous poet besides somebody that was having their first poem published there. Um, she was also always very clear thinking, I think, and she, um, her reputation is not just as a poet, I don't think it should be just as a poet, it's also as a woman who really fought for change, who fought for younger poets, who was conscious, and I think that poem that you are quoting there, um, Sandy, um, is, is an example of that. She was conscious of younger women and future women coming along and how important it was to, to shape a world, a better world for them. And I think that's really lovely. I want to single out one incident of those submissions to Poetry Ireland Review um, that she treated with such care. And this is a case of a young man called David Hanley. His poem was published in Poetry Ireland Review 127. That was a set, uh, two before her last one in the summer of 2019. And it was sent in by his mother um, after he had passed away suddenly in early 2019. Ivan liked the poem, and here it is. Voices. I have a disability, or am I disabled? Every day I fight the voices in my head. Burden, failure, hopeless, they scream at me. Never free from the voices in my head, but best foot forward, hiding my pain. Without my disability, what would I be? So Ivan published that poem, but she also sent the following reply to David's mother, Susan Hanley. Dear Susan, thank you for writing to me. This comes with all my sympathy for David's death. I was struck by this moving, eloquent piece, and we'll be glad to have it in memory of him in Poetry Ireland Review and of his talent. Warm wishes and sympathy. From Ivan. So I just think that was really, really, I mean, it's just one example, one small example of the way she treated the poems that came in and the people who sent them in. Um, I'd also like to read a little extract from her first and last editorials for Poetry Art and Review. They echo each other very strongly and they're about that word I mentioned earlier, conversation. Um, so her first editorial in um, May 2016, uh, she began by saying that being an editor is having a vantage point and sometimes it's hard to have an overview of what you're doing or what poetry is being written. But then this is Ivan. Looked at closely, something does emerge. A conversation, noisy and fractious certainly, and given to monologue at times rather than dialogue. But a conversation nonetheless, that can be thrilling in its reach and commitment. And that's what I've wanted to suggest here, however briefly, a conversation made up of poems, of course, but also of the energies that swirl around them, the ideas, the debates, the disagreements. The mm. most exciting part of this editorship has been reading the submitted poems, going through them poem after poem, image after image, brought back a cherished memory. Standing in a bookstore in Dublin when I was a young poet, Greens in Clare Street or Hodges Figgis, perhaps, taking a journal down from the shelf and opening it at a new poem. And if I was lucky, feeling there and then the intense lifelong companionship of good poetry. The poems I chose for this issue shook out that memory, except this time they were in the present, not the past. There are poems here from several countries written under various skies but the Irish work was a special revelation of the underivative vitality of poems on this island. Even if the continuance of poetic conversation, given the constraints of space, can only be hinted at here, its reach into the lives and work of poets and readers make it a permanent resource. So I think that's a really, she's saying herself there, what I was saying, that she, really loved reading all the poems that came in. She really enjoyed them and the stories behind them and the energies behind them, the disagreements, all those kind of things. 
And this is from her last editorial, um, issue 129, in December 2019. She, of course, thanked everybody. She was very uh, appreciative of uh, Maureen Canelli, the, the director, Paul Lennon, our publications manager, but also the interns and everybody who was in and out helping uh, to get the edition uh, off the ground. But my chief debt, of course, she says, is to the poets who submitted their poems. Reading them, I had the same response I'd had since I was young, a response that began whenever I took a volume of poems off the shelf in a bookshop or opened a magazine with a poem. Those pages revealed that someone had made the journey from their life to their language. Someone had followed their feelings to a form, had gone to a blank page, maybe with the little time they had at the end of their day, not to produce an epigram, but to find a truth. Because of what I saw then and have read since for Poetry Ireland Review, I've never doubted that it is working poets and the poem in its time that provides the most eloquent answer to the badly formed ideas that poetry is failing, that its audience is dwindling, that its usefulness is over. And certainly those comments do exist. And she quotes a few of them. I won't quote them all here. Um, she says they're always unfamiliar and they're always familiar, but they're always on sound. The size of the audience, the difficulty of the work, these are not true measurements of an art. If used, they lure critics into memorable understatements, like the critic of Hart Crane in the New York Times in 1933, who commented, his collected poems is not an unimportant book. <laughs> no poet, and the poet I read for Poetry Ireland Review illustrates should ever have to, have to write or live in these shadows. The life of the poet is always a summons to try to set down some truth that was once true and will go on being true. No poet should have to worry about the public respect or the lack of it which this art, in which this art is held. It's the poems I read in submissions to Poetry Ireland Review that are a constant reminder of this. Those words on the page, those stanzas, cadences, statements, at their best can and do lead to a single defining moment when someone takes down a book, maybe late at night, maybe looking for some confirmation of their own life and comes upon that poem they want to remember. That moment has held together this art from the beginning and it always will. So I think that's really, really fantastic around there. I mean, she's not just a wonderful thinker about poetry and a really crystal clear thinker always, but also, it's kind of reflecting some of her own life there. The person who only has a little bit of time at the end of a busy day to write a poem, the person who's looking for some piece of poetry to read at the end of a busy day. I think, you know, she was a busy woman and she was a woman bringing up children uh, when she was writing poetry, but she had a huge amount of humanity and sympathy for poets. And I think that's really lovely. Uh, I'm going to finish um, with uh, another of her poems that I absolutely love. Um, and I oh, thought this was very appropriate for this time of year. It's quite Hawthorne in the west of Ireland. Am I hearing a voice? <laughs> a disembodied voice is coming to me. Anyway. So, quite Hawthorne in the west of Ireland. Just at this time of the year, the Hawthorn is starting to come out in Ireland. Um, there's one beautiful Hawthorn tree in Bushy Park, a park near me. I go every week and look at it and look at this tree to see if it has started blossoming. And it is starting to blossom now. Uh, it's a tree that has huge superstition in Ireland. I've written about it myself, but I, I just love this one. Um, and I think there's there's one thing that reminds me of Van very strongly in this as well. I have said, I think she's a crystal clear thinker and a crystal clear writer. It's like looking into a pool that is absolutely pristine, no matter what's in it, you can see every single thing. And she talks about water and its fluency in this and its ability to redefine land. And I think that sums her up too for me. So here's White Hawthorne in the west of Ireland. I drove west in the season between seasons. I left behind suburban gardens, lawnmowers, small talk. Under low skies, past splashes of coltsfoot, I assumed the hard shyness of Atlantic life and the superstitious aura of Hawthorne. All I wanted then was to fill my arms with sharp flowers, to seem from a distance to be part of that ivory downhill rush. But I knew, I had always known 
The custom was not to touch Hawthorne, not to bring it indoors for the sake of the luck such constraint should forfeit. A child might die, perhaps, or an unexplained fever speckle heifers. So I left it stirring on those hills with a fluency only water has, and like water, able to redefine land, and free to seem to be for anglers and for travellers astray in the unmarked lights of a May dusk, the only language spoken in those parts. So that's um, my thinking about Ivan today. Mostly it's Ivan herself. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else. And thank you so much for having me, Sandy. Thank you so much, Catherine Ann Cullen, poet in residence from Poetry Ireland, uh, giving us that, that crystal clear glimpse into Ivan's work as Poetry Ireland Reviews editor. I have copies actually right behind me. Um, I have some of her books too. I always have the historians by me, like wherever I am now anyway. And um, just as a little anecdote, I can, I can testify to everything that you said about how she interacted. I am one of those very, very, very rarefied, fortunate people that happened to have had my very first poem in Poetry Ireland Review in issue 129, her final issue. And um, I had gotten a lovely invitation to come and join for the holiday party. And of course, living on the West Coast, I couldn't make the trip. I do have a little bit of regret about that now, of course. But um, and uh, yes, that crystal clear, pristine way of how she talked about poetry and curated it. It's very true if you go to listen, if you listen to those recordings that I mentioned, they're, they're on YouTube and you will hear exactly what Catherine Ann has described of how uh, Ivan spoke about poetry. Thank you again. Um, I can't wait, wait to talk more about uh, Ivan's work with you. Well, next we have, I, I just have to say, is just, I don't know how any other way to say it, is just a person that I love. You know, I just, I just love Jesse Lindenny so much. And I, I can say that because I'm here. <laughs> um, Jesse Lindenny was born in Arkansas in the United States and after years of travel, she settled in Ireland in 1981. Her previous collections include a book length prose poem, Daughter from 1988, which was reprinted as Daughter and other poems in 2001. She compiled and edited Salmon, A Journey in Poetry, from 1981 to 2007, poetry, reading it, writing it, publishing it, 2009, and dog singing, a tribute anthology in 2010. She is the co-founder since 1981 and managing director of Salmon Poetry. As I said, this year celebrating its 40th anniversary. Her poems and essays and articles have been widely published and she has given numerous readings, lectures and writing courses in Ireland and abroad, including at Yale University, Rutgers University, the Irish Embassy in Washington DC, the University of Alaska, Fairbanks and Anchorage, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, the Loft in Minneapolis, Cafe Teatra in Copenhagen, Denmark, the University of Arkansas, Fayetteville, the Irish American Cultural Center in Chicago, and the Bowery Poetry Club in New York City. She is currently working on a memoir to dance beneath the diamond sky and is truly her own force of poetry. Would you please welcome 
Jesse London. Hiya. <laughs> oh, golly, you can, you can imagine like the, the little Arkansas girl whose mother picked cotton and who couldn't afford to go to the, to the to, to university in the States. Uh, you can imagine me back at Yale, right? <laughs> And over everybody. Oh God. Okay. Um, Ivan. Uh, yeah, I was in. The, um, as we know, what a. It was just a horrible shock. What a shock. What a shock. Hi. Uh, I. Yeah. Uh, okay. I. I. Um, <laughs> I became a duck. <laughs> Am I still there, Sandy? Oh, hang on. Yeah? Still there? Okay. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, I can just see various things on the screen. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still here. If I'm still here, you're, you're fine I, now. I won't. I, I won't um, so there you are. Thank gosh. You look, you look just like a duck a minute ago. Oh, no, you're gone again. Very sorry, everybody. Very sorry. We are kicking people out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Good. I think there, uh, Honestly, um, as I say, with my background and um, a little bit of a chip on the shoulder, which you know, I probably still, I still have probably. But uh, coming, uh, coming to and settling in Galway, and then virtually immediately going into this writing workshop at, at UCG, um, my and I had been working in the Portuguese side in London for a time, but I, it was my um, feeling that there should be, like, where are the voices of the people? Do you know, where, where, where are the women's voices? Where the, you know, we should do a magazine. Let's do, you know. Anyway, so that and Ivan's background, which would be the Trinity College, the one, the background that I could never, would never have aspired to. And then it, you see, it all just completely melt away. Of course, when you've got when you've got poetry, uh, because it has to melt away. There has to be the connection to spirit and that's you know. so but however i was still quite amazed when ivan it not only stood up for salmon who we were you know it, it, oh it's complicated it's too complicated to go into it, the those days a lot of the sort of the breaking of you know who do you think you are and what do you you know and the precious irish heritage and the word the irish word and who oh, but um, Yvonne was someone who didn't, get, she, she was just so big hearted and, you know, so had such a big vision. Uh, so lo and behold, in the Irish Times one day, um, I saw that she had written something about our little salmon, which was at that point, like the, probably about six or seven issues. I'm not sure. I don't quite remember, but that's the, um, that's a little brochure. And in the Irish Times, she said, the salmon is beautifully produced and printed, a singularly heartening and attractive little magazine. I complete like saying, and she'd said, this is terrific, you know, keep going. There's got to be something coming out of, you know, out of, you know, yeah. So um, given, given, that that was so much unexpected for me. And I, even more sort of wonderful was her then support for the books, support for poets we were publishing. 
and uh, in and she written a lot about salmon with a, a huge praise. And as I say, you look back at it now and you say, well, yeah, why the hell wouldn't she? I mean, look at the poets. But then it, you know, then it was, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then it was taking a chance, you know, um, and sticking her neck out. And the old boy, you know, oh, I, I can't even, it's very emotional to me. You, you might have gotten that there. It's emotional to me. So I'm not I'm not going to 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 say very much more than that. It's just I um she gave such a boost, such a boost to salmon and to me and to people like Joan McBreen. Oh well we can, you know, all of all of us. Um that is here on the one hand there was Reed Ann Higgins who we knew had something to say. And the first the sort of the first West of Ireland working class woman to have published a book. I'm, I'm quite certain that's true. Um, and on the other, then you had Ivan saying, yes, I had that. I had that privilege. You know, I've had that privilege. Yet, you know, poetry is bigger than that. We're not going to fight about the perfect Irish poem. We're going to create poetry. And, you know, mm. and so I was very lucky that uh, in the uh, then, uh, early the 80s, there was a national poetry workshop, national writing workshop. And, and uh, Ivan was doing that. So one year, so I applied and so I got on. And so this is my little workshop poem. And then I want to read, um, well, I'll tell you when I'm gonna read it. So this is called Workshop 1984, Anna McCary, County Monaghan. Afternoon light on the big table at Anna McCarrick, a silent floating of expectations. There was a brilliant light in the sky last night over the lake, I say, so bright it could be aliens. Silence at the table. You surprise me, Jesse, a wry smile. And then you read my poem, paused, switched the first stanza for the second, and the poem became clear a mirror image of itself, Refle reflection, yes, of poetry and, and of what seems upright, but is really upside down. And the brilliant light isn't low in the sky, it is the sky. So that was, she was brilliant, she was wonderful, <laughs> great workshop leader. She was so deft, all those things like, talk about cut to the chase, do you know, just clear. And this poem, uh, when we did the uh, 25th uh, anniversary anthology, yeah, because we didn't do a 30th. No, 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 wait a minute, what year? Is this 40th, so, no, 30, something or other, it was an anthology. Yeah, it was, it was um, oh my God. Salmon and Journey in Poetry, yeah, 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 that one. <laughs> um, I asked Yvonne for a poem because she, I was including poems from the journal and so this was issue 16, winter 1986, fifth issue. <laughs> Ivan Bolin, The Women. This is the hour I love, the in-between, neither here nor there hour of evening. The air is tea-colored in the garden. The briar rose is spelled crepe de chine. This is the time I do my work best, going up the stairs in two minds in two worlds, carrying cloth or glass, leaving something behind, bringing something with me I should have left behind. The hour of change, of metamorphosis, of shape-shifting instabilities. My time of sixth sense and second sight, when in the words I choose, the lines I write, they rise like visions and appear to me, women of work, of leisure, of the night, and stove colored silks and lace in nothing, with crude, with crude needles, with books, with wide open legs, who fled the hot breath of the God pursuing, who ran from the split hoof and the thick lips and fell and grieved and healed into myth. And to me in this evening at my desk, testing the water with a sweet quartet, the physical force of a dissonance, the fusion of music into syllabic heat 
and generating, sorry, <clears throat> and getting sick of it and standing up and going downstairs in the last brightness <clears throat> into a landscape without emphasis, light, linear, precisely planned, a hemisphere of tiered, aired cotton, a hot terrain of linen from the iron folded in and over, stacked high, <clears throat> neat and flat, stoving heat and white. <clears throat> Okay, guys, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jesse, Len Denny, again. Um, many congratulations on every single one of those 40 years and for so eloquently talking about the legacy that uh, really you and Ivan created together for moving forward, um, for moving Irish literature, women in Irish literature forward. Um, we all owe an incredible debt of gratitude to mm -hmm. you as well as to Ivan. And so it's, it's just so fitting to have you here with us today. Mm -hmm. To share those, to share those yeah. early days, and it's very, very poignant, and I appreciate it immensely. Thank you, Thank and not you. And not just because I'm a salmon poet, but, <laughs> but, but because it's because it's because no. it's history, because it is history. It is. History. It is history. It's just incredible, and uh, what a wonderful person to us. Thank you. Mm. Well, next we have another one of my salmon sisters. Uh, you, you in the pre-show, I was just we were talking about. I call all of my folks my siblings from salmon, and um, I guess it's kind of taken off. And so uh, I. I'm so thrilled to be welcoming Rachel Haggerty, who is a Dubliner, and her debut collection, Flight Paths Over Fingless, won the 2018 Shine Strong Award. Mm -hmm. She is a child survivor of the Talbot Street, of the Talbot Street bomb, which was chronicled in her book. I'm just gonna show it to you because it's, I always have it near me also. May Day, 1974, from Salmon Poetry, 2019. The book has received incredible international acclaim. Rachel's forthcoming collection is called Dancing with Memory. Rachel's kids say this about her that she uses three F words too much. Fangless, feminism, and feckin'. <laughs> Would you, feckin' poetry. Would you please welcome Rachel Haggerty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandy, for that amazing introduction. Um, thanks for having me on. It's a great honor to be here with Jesse and Catherine Ann and the lovely Nesta. Um, while it's a great honor, it's also bittersweet. Uh, there is a part of me that wishes this was not the first year anniversary of the wonderful Ivan Boland. Um, but I think we should celebrate her legacy this evening and what a wonderful legacy she left us in her words and in her work as a poet and as an educator. I think she held that space really well. Um, my first time meeting Ivan Boland was as a, an undergraduate at UMass Boston, and uh, we were doing poetry from Ireland. And this one, Ivan was in town, so we were going to go see, hear her read in Harvard. And anyhow, I went up with my little book afterwards, and I said, will you sign me book? And she heard my accent, and she's like, where are you from? And I was like, Finglas. And she's like, all right. And then I said, I like your Akko woman. 
it's not anybody you'd see in Fingless, but I still like your Aka Woman poem. And she goes, oh, I'm sure a Fingless woman could write a poem that's similar to Aka Woman. Um, and I often think that was my moment of being told, stop messing, go away and write your poems. Uh, so that was my first meeting with Ivan. And then in 1994, I got to meet her in Dublin. It was 94, 95. And I was doing a workshop uh, as one of her students in the Irish Writers' Centre. Uh, Eastern Washington University had taken over the space and they had uh, a couple of scholarships for Dubliners and I was looking up to get on. Um, and I'm going to read a poem uh, from that time that she was writing and that year Ivan was the poet in residence at the National Maternity Hospital here in Dublin and one of the doctors possibly the master of the rotunda the so-called master of the rotunda of master of the hollow street just imagine calling a doctor like the master uh, and all the women are the ones who are performing the miracles I never had any men in my burden room it's like feck off but anyhow somebody said to Ivan oh why don't you talk to the mothers you know and Ivan looked horrified at them and said I've had my two my own two babies trust me after birth you don't want to talk to anybody least of all about poetry and I thought that's bang on um, but anyway uh, she told us in that workshop that what we had to do was to take an image hang on to the image and let the image do some work. So this is one of Ivan's poems from her stint as the writer in residence in Dublin and Ireland's National Maternity Hospital. Tree of life. A tree on a moonless night has no sap or color. It has no flower and no fruit. It waits for the sun to find them. I cannot find you in this dark hour. Dear child, wait for dawn to make us clear to one another. Let the sun inch above the rooftops. Let love be the light that shows again the blossom to the root. In memory of the babies who had died at National Maternity Hospital. And I think that poem for me was not only a great gift of the technique of using imagery in a poem, but it's also a measure of the woman, Ivan Boland, and the poet, Ivan Boland. In this place of birth and celebration and new mothers and new fathers and new children, she chose to remember the almost born, the lost ones, the ones who, um, never got the chance to voice and she commemorated them in this beautiful poem called The Tree of Life. And this is from one of the, the books um, that she did with Jodie Allen, Allen Randolph and Paula Meehan and they sent her off around the whole of Dublin and she took photographs of Dublin herself and this is a photograph of her poem in Merrion Square that still remains there today commemorating all of those babies um, we didn't quite make it out of the National Maternity Hospital. So that's our gorgeous Ivan. Um, so I, I lived away for uh, a while. I lived in America for seven years and I lived in Japan um, for three years. Um, but while I was in Japan, uh, Paula Meehan sent me this poem of collections of Ivan's called The Last Land. And in it, Ivan has written, for Rachel, with warm wishes and lots of love from home, Ivan Boland. Um, and I remember like being in Shimane in Western Japan, two hours north of Hiroshima city going, oh, look at this. Um, and this collection, The Lost Land, meant that I found home again. And from that decision, I decided to come home in uh, the year 1999. Um, so I read a poem from that collection. It's part of a, a longer series that she's written um, called Colony and it's part six and it's called The Scar. The Scar. Dawn on the river 
Dublin rises out of what reflects it. Anna Liffey looks to the east, to the sea, for her profile carved out by the light on the old Carlisle Bridge. I was five when a piece of glass cut my head and left a scar. Afterwards, my skin felt different and still does on these autumn days when the mist hides the city from the Liffey. The Liffey hides the long ships, the muskets and the burning domes. Everything but this momentary place and those versions of the Irish rain which change the features of a granite face. If colony is a wound, what will heal it? After such injuries, what difference do we feel? No answer in the air, on the water, in the distance, and yet. Emblems of this old, torn and traded city, altered by its river, its weather. I turn to you as if there were one flawed head towards another. And for me, I love this poem because it really gets into that uh, idea of the poem and the poet's relationship with place. But also I think it's an exploration of a woman's relationship with her home place and very particular kinds of patriarchal home places, you know, and the idea of Ireland being colonized by Britain or women being disenfranchised by men. It's all there in this poem called The Scar, but she chose us to look at the humanity of it all, you know. I only learned a few years back what intersectionality meant, you know, that overlapping systems of oppression. And I think the scar is that. It, the scar is those overlapping systems of oppression. But she found it written on her body and then she wrote it out of her body and into the world. Um, so she's quite the trickster and crafter of a, po of a poet and she taught me crafts. So anybody who's thinking, I know people are out there and they want to go up in the open mic, but I can't heartily recommend this book enough. It's called The Making of a Poem. And that's one of Ivan's books that really set me on my way. You know, Ivan told me that I had no problem with my voice. I had a great voice, but I needed to have a bit of respect for the form. So <laughs> these books were very helpful for me. And then the other thing that she gave, this other book is called The Making of the Sonnets. And this is a really deadly uh, book that Ivan co-wrote um, with uh, Edward Hurt. And it's it looks at like all the possibilities. And as somebody from a song tradition and a working class background, I would have gone villanelle me fucking arse. Like, but the fact of it is, is that actually there's a place for villanelles and it's really a good way to get revenge if you use uh, a really traditional form and then put in totally irreverent content. So uh, Ivan was great like that. And I think as a poet and as an educator, she was uh, just one of kind. So I'd heartily encourage people, if you are whatever uh, way you are on your journey as a poet. And oh yeah, and then she has another one called uh, a journey with two maps and that's really good at looking at um, writing as an outsider and whatever way you feel as an outsider not just like a woman or somebody who is from uh, any kind of minority uh, it's it's good um, so the last time I saw Ivan was like Catherine Ann was in the back kitchen at Poetry Ireland and when I look back now, the back kitchen at Poetry Ireland and uh, Catherine Ann was coming in and out. I was there with Ivan and then um, Casey Donovan was also there. And in the midst of this, 
lands me husband and me kids and the husband had a dinner for me to put in the microwave and uh, the kids were running around doing the Highland fling and uh, Ivan said to me how old are your kids and I was like 14 and 15 because you know you can't get pregnant when you're breastfeeding and she burst out laughing going oh yeah you got caught on that did you <laughs> I got caught um, and like if I look back now, I think, Jesus, like, we should have been talking about poetry. And like I was in that issue 129 and I was going to be reading at that uh, wonderful Christmas party that it was. We weren't talking about poetry at all. We were talking about the best way to make a cup of tea, the fact of what vegetables do well in the microwave and what vegetables don't do well in the microwave. Um, our kids, her grandkids um, her, and her daughters, it all featured in there. There wasn't a word about poetry like what do poets talk about not poetry <laughs> and it felt warm and it felt lovely and it felt domestic and it felt woman-centered in that back kitchen of poetry island and I think that's where I will always stay in my imagination with Ivan Boland in the back kitchen with other women, men coming and going, children coming and going, having the chat. Um, because for me, the great gift she gave me as a poet was saying, whatever you want to have in a poem, you can put in a poem, whether it's about parenting, whether it's about living in a suburb on the edge of a city, whether it's about living on the edge of a society because you're from a different class or a different dominant gender, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want in a poem, it's your choice as the writer. Um, so the last poem that I'm going to read and the last words that I'll say about Ivan um, are going to be in her words. Uh, I feel as a poet, as a student, as a woman, as an Irish person, as a citizen of the world, I was blessed to know Ivan Boland and I think we're all blessed to have her words. So this is this moment. This moment, a neighborhood at dusk, things are getting ready to happen out of sight, stars and moths and rhymes slanting around fruit, but not yet. One tree is black, one window is yellow as butter. A woman leans down to catch a child who has run into her arms this moment. Stars rise, moths flutter, apples sweeten in the dark. Thanks very much. Wow. Thank you, Rachel. That really like intimate portrait of your like thread line with Ivan Boland from, you know, being a student, not once, but twice. And then that amazing image of being in the back kitchen at Poetry Ireland. You know, what an, what a, what an extraordinary portrait of her as a person and of course her poetry and her connection to how that influenced, you know, your poetry and your voice. There's really not much, I can't say anything better than what you've said. Thank you so much. Well, our final, our final uh, guest featured special guest today is another one of my salmon sisters, uh, Nessa O'Mahoney. 
and Nessa, um, well, you're going to hear. You're going to hear everything that you need to hear from Nessa. I'm going to go straight to the bio. It speaks for itself. Um, Nessa O'Mahony was born and lives in Dublin, and her poetry has appeared in a number of Irish, UK, and North American periodicals and has been translated into several European languages. She won the National Women's Poetry Competition in 1997 and was shortlisted for the Patrick Kavanaugh Prize and Hennessy's Literature Awards. Her second poetry collection, Trapping a Ghost, was published by Blue Chrome Publishing in 2005, a verse in novel, In Sight of Home, is published by Salmon Poetry, and the third collection, The Side Road to Star, was also published by Blue Chrome. She was awarded an Irish Arts Council Literature Bursary in 2004. She completed a PhD in creative and critical writing at the University of Wales, Bangor in 2007. She's been the John at the, she's been the artist in residence at the John Hume Institute for Global Irish Studies at the University of College Dublin and the, edit, the assistant editor at the UK literary journal Orbis among so many other accomplishments. And she just last week, the co-editor of the anthology Empty House with Siobhan Campbell was launched last week with Door Press. Would you please welcome Nessa and her my truncated biography of her? Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, whoever that person was, I'd like to meet her sometime. Um, and it was great. It's just such an honor to, to, to be here with you and with all of these amazing people uh, who I have been working with and listening to and appreciating um, Yvonne's work and uh, the contribution that, that she's left all of us. Just, just before this event, some of us were at the beginning of a Poetry Ireland tribute and Paula Meehan was talking about how we will all carry Yvonne's name and her memory into the future. And I think this is what we're sort of doing now. We're, we're, we're you know, part of the afterlife, part of the legacy. And um, it's, it's, it's lovely to be talking about her now. And, and it's really interesting because um, Rachel Hegarty has, has just solved a major mystery for me in relation to the back kitchen of Poetry Ireland, as did Catherine Ann before her, because let me take you back to December 2017, Poetry Ireland, the launch of Ivan Boland Inside History, gives a quick wave to the camera, uh, which was a collection of essays and poetry that, that was edited by myself and Siobhan Campbell, um, the poet. And so we're kicking off, it's eight o'clock, um, the room is full, absolutely crowded. Every feminist that there ever was in Ireland, um, who was still alive, was in that room in Poetry Ireland. And we knew that Yvonne Boland was going to be there. We knew that Mary Robinson, her great friend and the former president of Ireland was going to be there because she had agreed to say a few words. She'd written the foreword to the, the collection of, of essays. Um, we knew our publisher, Alan Hayes from Ireland House was going to be there, but there wasn't a sign of any of them. And Siobhan and I are kind of wandering around the room and saying, you know, will we get started? And what are we going to do if the guest of honour isn't here? And they were all down in the back kitchen, having a natter, having a chat. And like Siobhan and I are going, well, nobody told us about the green room in Poetry Ireland. So eventually they come back and uh, we get a chance. And in fact, I, if I, hopefully I can show this to the camera as well. It's probably one of my proudest ever moments and photographs of myself in the normal flow. Ivan, Mary Robinson, um, Colin Tobin is there looking very scholarly and Alan Hayes. 
and um, it was such a thrill to do it, largely because in the process of, of producing that book, and it was very much Siobhan Campbell's initial idea that um, how was it that a writer of the international prominence of Ivan Boland hadn't been written about critically in book form? There had been individual essays here and there in journals and that sort of thing, but certainly not within Ireland had there been any sort of bringing together of scholarly essays um, our critical appreciation of, of, of Ivan Boland. Now, no shortage, and yes, I'm generalizing for, for dramatic effect here, no shortage of books about Heaney and Mahan and Muldoon and Montague and you name it, the male poets who had got that kind of critical attention. But for whatever reason, women poets were not being written about. Um, and certainly Ivan, at this stage was possibly far better known elsewhere uh, in critical terms than in Ireland. So Siobhan had interviewed her, Siobhan had done a wonderful interview with her at the Poetry Now Festival in Dunleary. Um, and I think on the back of that was beginning to think, okay, it would be really important to try and, and produce a book. And it was in, she, Ivan was, to be 70 in, uh, I think it was 2016. So we were aiming to make that um, anniversary, but uh, it ran over. These books always take longer than it seems. So it was 2017 when we published it. But it was such a, a, a great thing to see the sort of the warmth. We, we approached poets, we approached academics, we approached critics um, and there was such warmth um, in the reaction of people who, who were delighted to get the opportunity to talk about you know the difference she'd made to them um, you know the qualities they appreciated in her work how they remembered her as a young woman um, you, and drawing this together and and I think for me as somebody who didn't really know her work to be, you know, in all honesty, and I know I'm among friends here. Um, I didn't grow up in poetry knowing Ivan's work particularly well. I was taught literature in UCD in the 1980s. And as far as the curriculum was concerned, you know, every writer was male and mostly dead. Um, I think Emily Dickinson got mentioned once, and that was the extent of the, the female contribution to English literature in UCD in the early 1980s. So it was really only, and I started writing in the mid 90s and, and Ivan was in the States at that stage. So I didn't come through the, the workshopping process that, that people have been talking about here, Jesse. In other words, I know Jean O'Brien um, has spoken a lot about that, that experience of being in workshops with her as well. Um, I didn't experience that. I read Object Lessons and part of me was going, who is this woman who was writing about her aesthetic? And, you know, I was being so conditioned by my education that it was a surprise to me to find somebody writing about herself with the seriousness, writing about her poetics. You know, women didn't do that. So I was so grateful to Siobhan Campbell for coming up with the idea and then getting me involved because it meant that I got to read through all of her back catalog, to think seriously really for the first time about how um, what I was writing was in a tradition um, that she discussed and that she explained and that you know preoccupations that I had with history or with family were things that she was already um, exploring and explaining and um, you know, setting a path for anybody who wanted to 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 try and follow her on. So, so I was very much a late arrival, um, which is probably why I feel so cheated. I guess now that there wasn't time to just get to know her better. Like, we did the book, we did a couple of events. I, I, I interviewed her in London. We had a, a lovely chatty, gossipy cup of tea in a little tea room in, in, in Bloomsbury. 
Um, and I'd have loved to have had the odd cup of tea with her in the Dundrum shopping centre or the odd natter in the back kitchen of Poetry Ireland. But time ran out and, and you know, so many of us are expressing that sense of, you know, for all the wonderful, wonderful poems that she had already written, what would she have written in her late 70s, in her 80s? How would she have charted us out of this current mess we're in and into the future? And, and maybe that's just really selfish in not saying, well, she did amazing things. Um, isn't that enough for us? It should be enough for us. But at the same time, that that was that sense of, oh, but there was still so much to do, still so much that she could have shown us. Um, so I wanted to read one poem, which was in the Ivan Bolin Inside um, History book, which Thomas Kinsler wrote for her, um, which really very much evokes the, the young Ivan in Trinity College, um, in the 1960s, and it's called Westland Row. We came to the outer light down a ramp in the dark, through eddying cold gusts and grit, our ears stopped with noise. The hands of the station clock stopped, or another day vanished exactly. The engine departing hammered slowly overhead. Dust blowing under the bridge, we stooped slightly with briefcases and books and entered the wind. The savour of our days restored, dead on nostril and tongue, drowned in air. We stepped on our own traces, not on stone, nodded and smiled distantly and followed our scattering paths, not stumbling not touching, until in a breath of benzene from a garage mouth by the Academy of Music coming against us, she stopped an instant in her wrinkled coat and ducked her childish cheek in the coat collar to light a cigarette, seeing nothing thick-lipped in her grim composure. Daughter, wife, look upon me. And that made me think because there was a really interesting article in the um, Irish Times today by, by a, a, a scholar and critic called Louisa Collins about how come we haven't named a place in Dublin after Ivan yet? Um, you know, when will we be good at acknowledging our writers' legacies and particularly our women writer legacies? And it struck me that. Um, and this is a very sort of cheeky suggestion, but but uh, there's a certain amount of, of controversy at the moment in Trinity College about you know its legacy and the links with uh, eminent philosophers of the past who maybe had slave links, um, Berkeley being one of them. And it struck me, wouldn't it be wonderful if they renamed the Berkeley Library as the Boland Library? Because goodness knows she spent very formative, very important times in that library. And, you know, w we now have a woman provost of Trinity for the first time in its history. So maybe she might think about making that gesture. Um, because I think, I think naming is important. Um, and she spent a lot of time in her own work thinking about the implications of the names we know and the names we don't know. So, um, I think that would be a good thing. Um, and I want to finish just with, um, because again, and other people have spoken about her, her the importance of family to her and, and, and just how uh, treasured her children were um, and all of those amazingly tender moments when she evokes motherhood and daughterhood. Um, and simply for the very subjective reason that, that her daughter Ivan got married on the 16th of October, 2012, and I married my husband on the 24th of October, 2012. Um, so I recognize what she's describing here. It's called, and it's from her collection, 
A Woman Without a Country. Wedding Poem. On the occasion of the marriage of Ivan Casey to Eamon Barry, 16th of October, 2012. Now on this day of promises, October light finds a way to join the distance to our sight for a moment that cannot stay. As if to prove what we know, there is no ordinary day. Now on this day of promises, one hand beneath and one above, each with a separate history, will join together as if to prove the never worn out covenant. There is no ordinary love. And I think for a poet who claimed the ordinary as a numinous space, the domestic, the suburbs, the night feeds, um, I think we are all profoundly grateful for that and for that legacy. Um, and it was a great privilege to know her for the brief period that I did. So thanks, thanks Andy for asking me to take part tonight. Thank you um, so much, Nessa. And I am just so, you know, I'm so struck by, you know, that's that a little of that cheated feeling that you talk about, you know, there, 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 there did seem to be, there's always more to do, right? There, there's always, there's always more work to be done um, among all of us poets, but women poets in particular, and that that she has, that she and Jesse like have set this path and that um, that we are standing in many ways on their shoulders and that we have the responsibility to continue, you know, that work. I mean, that's certainly one of the reasons that I host these, that, that I put these things together is to make sure that as the poet Audre Lorde often asks, are you doing your work? And uh, I thank you for doing your work, bringing out that very first uh, critical look at Ivan's work. The book is Ivan Boland, Inside History, co-edited with Siobhan Campbell. And you'll see all the other uh, books of Nessa's in the chat, along with all of our other illustrious featured guests today. It's been a great privilege to hear all of your voices. I'm reminded also in your final remark about that, that's those spaces of domesticity. I see the image of another poet that I love, Marie Howe, who in Poetry Ireland's memorial last May, when she came on to screen, the first thing she did was kind of laugh because behind the sheet that she had put up, again, this was in the early days of the pandemic and we were all figuring out how to be on these screens. She had a white bed sheet up and she pulled the curtain away to reveal a washing machine. And she said that she felt that that was so, so fitting, a thing to have behind her. And she sort of felt the presence of a van in all the ways that she brought the, the domestic ordinary uh, into focus um, for, for posterity, really. So thank you for reminding us of that. Well, we are now, uh, I wanna remind you again um, of the four extraordinary women that we've just heard from uh, speaking about their connections um, with Ivan Boland. We heard first from Catherine Ann Cullen, poet, 
in residence, the inaugural poet in residence at Poetry Ireland, I might add. Jesse Lendenny, founder, managing editor, wrangler of poets, of hundreds of poets in the 40th anniversary year of Salmon Poetry. Rachel Haggerty, what, what a journey and your work, extraordinary. If you join us and just next weekend, you're going to hear her read from May Day, 1974. And of course, you heard Nessa herself speak about her work in, uh, in addition to her own incredible fiction, her poetry, her editorial prowess, her bringing to the forefront, the first critical work of Ivan Boland. The book is Ivan Boland, Inside History. Thank you to all of you. I have such immense respect, love, and gratitude for you being with us here today. Well, we're going to move to the open mic, Kim, aren't we? We're moving to the open mic and we're going, um, as you know, I really love to bring as many voices in as possible. And so it seemed very, very fitting today to hold a space where you, the beloved audience members could also share um, poems from um, the incredible, incredible, body of work that we have from Ivan Boland. And um, I will start the open mic. Each of us will have three minutes and to read one poem, your uh, poem of Ivan's or one that I, I'm, I am, it's possible that some of you have a poem that like Rachel, like that was inspired by, by Ivan. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your, um, all of your, all of your poems. And uh, Kim will help me with the chat in, uh, in announcing who will be up to read. And then we were going, we're going to end with uh, that video of, of Ivan reading, our future will be, our future will become, our future will become the, our future will become the past of other women. That is the final poem in her collection. We're, we're gonna cue that up and hear from her. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out the open mic by reading actually the title poem from the historians. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, it occurred to me that it's very possible that this collection, which to me epitomizes so many of the themes, like it really is that, I don't want it to be the, that final collection, but the fact that it is, it, it, seems, it seems such the perfect container. And I, I can't help but feel that it's gotten a little lost in the pandemic. And so I really wanna lift that collection up today and do my part to, to keep this collection in the conversation. This is the title poem, The Historians. Say the word history. I see your mother, mine, the light sober, the summer well over, an east wind, dandling leaves, rain, stirring at the curb. Their hands are full of words. One of them holds your father's journal with its note written on the day you were born. The other, my small rhymed scratchings, my fervent letters before the poem ends, they will have burned them all. Now say the word again. Summon our island, a story that needed to be told. The patriots still bleeding in the lithographs, 
when we were born, those who wrote that story labored to own it. But these are women we loved, record keepers with a different task to stop memory becoming history, to stop words healing what should not be healed. It is cold, the light is going. They kneel now behind their greenhouses, beneath whichever tree is theirs. The leaves shift down, each of them puts a match to the paper. Then they put their hands close to the flame. They feel the first bite of the wind. They lace their pages with fire. I finish writing. That's the title poem of Evan Bullen's The Historians. Thank you. All right, Kim, here we go to the open mic. And uh, I'm not seeing my list. So I'm wondering if you would start us off by introducing the first person and I'll get myself organized here. Sure, next up is Ray Ball. Ray Ball. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy, and Cultivating Voices for putting on this tribute and I was so moved by everything that the speaker said. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Ivan personally, um, but I'm very much drawn to her work because in my daily life, I'm a historian um, and it's only in my shadow life that I'm a poet. And I loved what people had to say about um, her uh, clear vision, her treatment of history, um, and the way that she sees history as, as textured with place, uh, with memory, uh, with people's pain, um, with scars that maybe should not um, be entirely healed. Um, and so for that reason, I'm going to read Violence Against Women. Um, it's from her collection, Domestic Violence. Violence Against Women. Once in the West Pennines, I was shown the source of the industrial revolution, the first streams harnessed to the wheels, which drove the mills, which spun out textiles, which emptied out the cottages and hillsides and sent men and women down to Hades, fast water and mountains without lime and greed all complicit in the shame. Real men and women, flesh and blood and long dead and ready to be understood and not those abandoned and unsaved. Women who died here, who never lived, mindless, sexless, birthless, only stunned by shadows, only dressed in muslin, shepherdesses of the English pastoral, waiting for the return of an English April that never came and never will again. Wheels turned, the jenny worked, a plain spoken poetry was chanted by the flow and finished them. They were the last to know what happened in this north facing twilight. The aftermath I saw here staring at an old site of injury, a hurt that never healed and never can. Oh, art. O oh, empire and the arranged relations so often covert between power and cadence. Tell me what it is you have done with the satin bonnets and the pastel sun, with the women gathering their unreal sheep into real verse for whom no one will weep. 
thing. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, I want to just give a, I want to just share that I met Ray in, I believe it was February at Poetry Parlay in a, a reading series out of Anchorage, Alaska. And that reading series uh, that, is, that is curated by Sandra Clevin has a featured poet. Ray was the featured poet and then a poet of influence. And Ivan was the poet of influence that night. And what struck me so powerfully that evening was that every person that read one of Ivan's poems, it was like an extraordinary reading, which just speaks to how incredible her poetry is. Like that every person who can get up to the mic and read a poem and you're just floored by it. That's how good the work is. That's how, you know, we've used those out, that crystal clear, that precision, that, that exquisite craft. So thank you, Ray, for bringing me back to that night and for bringing yourself here today to share your poem of Evans with us. We'll see you soon. Well, next is Marcella Raymond. Hello and welcome. And uh, if everyone on the open mic, when you join us, would you tell us where you're joining us from so that we get that sense of where you all are bringing your tribute from today. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for um, having me. Um, thank you for this beautiful, beautiful tribute and for um, this incredible portrait of Ivan um, and her humanity. Um, I'm joining from South Dakota in, in the center of the United States today. Um, I want to say that one of the things that strikes me about Yvonne is um, what all the speakers have talked about, and that's, um, and, and was also in the poem that Ray read, um, her plain spoken poetry, and um, by that, I mean just getting to the point um, and not hiding the um, central image or idea of the poem. Um, and also the, the weight and the significance and oftentimes the temporary nature of um, ordinary life. Um, so I'm gonna read a, an original poem, um, which is, totally not in Yvonne's league, but was inspired by um, her poem, Moths, um, because I really um, just love that poem, <laughs> Moths. So um, if I can figure out how to find this. Okay, so this is called Hummingbird Moth after Yvonne Boland. On a summer afternoon, she appears Himaris, bee hawk moth, snowberry clear wing. She is here, not having come lazily along, but a sudden apparition. She is chimera, part heart melting hummingbird, her fan tail waggling, rolled tongue unfurled to dip into bee balm, million bells, flocks, and part nightmare, fringed antenna searching, yellow cape of fur, scaled wings nearly transparent. She will stick her larva to the underside of honeysuckle leaves, leave her young to drop on the grass, wrap themselves in silk, wait for spring. I am elbow deep in a thicket of tomato vines 
knees clicking like cards on bike tires when her hovering stirs a vibration along my spine. Like her, my season here is short. We will both beat our wings to exhaustion and when too soon glorious adults emerge from torn cocoons, we will fall down, she and I, burrow beneath the leaf litter and sleep. Thank you. Wow, just beautiful. Uh, you, Marcella, you are exactly the epitome of who I had hoped would, would come also to read a poem that was inspired by Ivan. So thank you for your offering today. And I'll, and I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> well, next is another of my family and siblings. The amazing, amazing Bertha Rogers. Uh, editor of Bright Hill Press. Hello, Bertha. Thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm coming to you from the Catskill Mountains of New York. And uh, I want to say that I've been reading Yvonne's poetry for a long, long time. And she's she and one other poet, William Stafford, are, uh, are writers, poets who are great inspirers <laughs> for other writers. So I decided to, I, I was rereading her work and there's a poem called And Soul, which was about her mother's death that inspired me to write about my mother's death. So um, my poem is called Her Turn. When it was her turn, the cellar steps welcomed her. She tripped down the wooden flight as lightly as a dancer on a polished floor, arms raised to pin sheets to the line, prairie breeze wrapping bleached percale about her flowered house dress, her waist, her breast, her knees. It was late summer when she was summoned, the sky as blue as the larkspurs in her own mother's garden. Clouds rolled over talking tall corn saying, yes, it's time, time for home, your old body's done. Her children came running through August heat. They steered their cars to childhood, flying but not believing. She smiled, no more digging, no planting, mowing, no more Holsteins inclining heads to pasture grasses. Barn cats rolled in golden straw the crooked creek snapping turtles closed mean beaks, allowed dark water to wring their rocky shells, slept. Sandbar willows ceased waving, the bridge creaked, and then, then she rested her head on pearl clouds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bertha. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Yvonne, for all that inspiration. Yeah. Incredible. Wonder, I'm so glad to see you here today, and we'll see you again very soon. Yes. And Sam and sister. Sam and sister, <laughs> indeed. Indeed. I did say it. I did say it again. You did say it. Oh, I, yeah. But I think I'm good. drinking too much rum. Okay. It's all good. <laughs> it's a big family. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big Big school of fish. <laughs> well, next, I'm so glad to see Patrick Lodge joining us today. Thank you for being here. How wonderful. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's thank you, Sandy, and everyone for this event. It's just absolutely marvelous to be involved, indeed. And I, I'm, I'm in, um, in Yorkshire, in the United Kingdom, England. Uh, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and I was, was entranced by Evan Boland's uh, very famous poem, The Emigrant Irish. Um, the, the closing line enters my head unbidden frequently, the, um, and all the old songs and nothing to lose. 
Uh, my family left Kinsale in the 1920s for Barry Dock in South Wales, where I was born. But uh, my identity, my sense of self has always been, for me, contested and contingent. And I'll read a poem called uh, Schlan Valia. I think the poem reflects this. It was drafted about a year ago. So, uh, Schlan Valia. Always, I am the emigrant at sea, fathomless, no questions, no answers. Sea buoys me up as long as I move, gives me passage. Can't see land, stern or bow. I sail, never arriving. Can't recall leaving. I'm not alone. Ghosts of those I knew, and some I didn't, stare as I leave. As I approach, too, I have a claim to stake. There is the blood litany to chant, one drowned chasing the herring, one marched to fife and drum. He took the queen's shilling. The women, too, mothers and grandmothers, stunted in exile, like the scrap of shamrock flown in annually, buried in foreign earth, never rooting. They were short-changed, exchanging the long key, the dock view road, a wild Atlantic way for a channel going nowhere. Those ghosts call, waving shreds of histories, scraps of charts, like handkerchiefs fluttering at a quayside. They mouth, as if I might comprehend, as if arriving I should know I'm there, home. If I was lost on this sea, what would they look for to know me? The cleft on the chin, the green eyes, must have come from somewhere. The quick red temper, the sadness seen in most things. Wh whose are these? I have always found a way out, never a way back in, safe home. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful, beautiful reading. Thank you so much, Patrick Lodge. I'm struck, of course, tonight, um, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you're joining me from, <laughs> that uh, any, you know, um, almost everyone here reading has read with us before are, are, are all such accomplished writers in your own right. And I'm very grateful to have all your voices, um, appreciating the voice of the Van Boland and great to hear you this evening, Patrick. Be well, we'll see you soon. Well, next is Susanna Case joining us, I know from New York, I'm very happy to have you here with us today in the, in the Zoom studio. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sandy. Well, I'm, it, what appeals to me, what really speaks to me in Boland's work is the use of history and the, the sense of humanity. And so I've chosen a poem of hers that is one of my favorites that reveals both of those things. And I think it's a, a fairly well-known poem of hers, Quarantine, but I, I thought it was worth revisiting today. And it is set, of course, during the Great Famine. So this is her poem, Quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and west and north until at nightfall under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. 
Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory, their death together in the winter of 1847. Also, what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and woman, and in which darkness it can best be proved. Thank you. I'm really, really glad that someone chose to read Quarantine and I get chills every time I hear it. And you can hear her read the poem. There's many videos of her on YouTube. Uh, she reads it in almost all every single one of her readings. Uh, it's a poem that I've I've probably heard her read now hundreds of times on those videos because I listen for the cadence of that poem. Like it is like just the finest, like it's like fine tuned. The precision is, is extraordinary, um, let alone the image and the images. And as you said, the history. Thank you so much for sharing quarantine with us. Um, it's, it's hard, it was also incredible that that poem got lifted so quickly also in the pandemic, like people were paying attention to the poem and then she passed, which, which amplified the significance of the poem, even though it was already an incredibly significant poem in her oeuvre of work, you know, in her oeuvre. So thank you, Susanna, we'll see you very soon. Be well, appreciate you bringing that today. Well, next we have, Rosalind Callahan, hello. Beautiful to have you with us today. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. What an absolutely wonderful evening. I'm listening from Derry in the north of Ireland. And um, it's, ju it's just absolutely amazing the amount of support here. I am 61 and I just started writing last year. So I'm struggling to find my feet, but I'm sure that I'm sure that Miss Boland would have helped support me. So um, I hope I don't lower the tone uh, too much by, by this offering, but it's absolutely fabulous. I also think it's a great idea of Nessa's to rename the library. So let us know what we can do to put pressure on for that. And a female provost in Trinity, absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm sure you'll understand when I say that I did live through the the war here in the north of Ireland. So it does sort of be a bit of a theme for, for some work. So I'll go ahead and read it. It's called From Tears to Truth. For sale on eBay, February, 2021, one 26 ton Foden Pyrene fortified military truck, ex museum piece, not in working order, condition used. The boy holds the man's hand as they dander along a busy strand road pavement heading for ice creams. Thoughts of hundreds and thousands of sprinkles with a chocolate flake light up his face. A drenched boy chokes, coughs and weeps in drifts of tear gas. His lacerated hands grasp a shivering nubble of brick ripped from a bogside pavement to make civilian ammunition as rubber bullets fired by boys in soldiers garb soar through the air and the black raptors glisten with weapon water spewed from the cannon housed in a Foden Pyrene fortified 26 ton truck. A river runs through our conflict ravaged city, which is exhausted, deconstructed, and its people dispossessed and hopeless. Songs of peace are drowned by chants of war. Hands of wounded healers tentatively reach out across a divide as deep as fear and wide as hate, clump by clawed 
and brick by block, building a bridge of peace over foil waters. The man holds the boy's hand as they dander along a busy strand road pavement heading for ice creams. Rigid scars of warfare on his palm branch from his wrist and curl around his grandson's pudgy warmth. Thank you. Well, bravo for your debut here. <laughs> Thank and, you. Thank you. <laughs> you come right on back. Get in touch with me. Yes, you are welcome. Your voice is strong and necessary. And I look forward to hearing you next time. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's wonderful. Amazing. Well, next, uh, we our final two readers. Um, uh, next is Amitahayab Bacha, where it's it's got to be like four o'clock in the morning. I'm guessing. So I a big <laughs> shout out for the very very early morning on April twenty eighth. Now for you, my friend. Mm. Oh, on mute. And you just need to unmute there, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, in, in an old journal of mine, I found uh, a poem of Bolan's that I love very much. It's called Mother Ireland. And with your permission, I'd like to read that. Yeah. At first, I was land. At first, I was land. I lay on my back to be fields. And when I turned on my side, I was a hill and of freezing stars I did not see. I was seen. Night and day, words fell on me. Seeds, raindrops, chips of frost. From one of them, I learned my name. I rose up. I remembered it. Now I could tell my story. It was different. And the story told about me. And now also it was spring. I could see the wound I had left in the land by leaving it. I traveled west. Once there, I looked with so much love at every field as it unfolded. Its rusted wheel and pram chassis. And at the gorse bright distances I had been, that they misunderstood me. Come back to us, they said. Trust me, I whispered. Thank you. Thank you. Get some sleep. <laughs> uh, and I will see you soon. I know you are so devoted to mm -hmm. always being with us and it is it is always it is always an honor and treasure thank you um it will see you very soon be well and thank you for bringing mother ireland what what an again iconic poem of boland's and i love that it's in that journal of yours beautiful <laughs> Well, our final reader before we're going to try to go to our video, which I think Kim is getting ready for us. I'm so glad. It just seems really appropriate because um, Marion Lovett was the person who gifted me the historians. And so I'm really happy to have her here reading a poem today. And of course, thank you for that gift. I mean, thank you for the gift of being you. 
I met you in at the Salmon Poetry Bookshop when I was performing my favorite job ever that I've ever had, which is selling books at the counter. Almost, almost two years ago now, Sandy. I'd like to read um, a, one poem from the historians and time permitting, if it's possible, Sandy, just to read the poem that I then wrote kind of in response to that. So um, Evan's poem, The Fire Gilder, really did inspire my homage called Silver Point. So I'll, I'll read the two. The Fire Gilder. She loved silver. She loved gold, my mother. She spoke about the influence of metals, the congruence of atoms, the art class classes where she learned these things. Think of it, she would say, as she told me. To gild any surface, a master craftsman had to meld gold with mercury, had to heat both so one was volatile, one was not. And to do it right, had to separate them and then burn, burn, burn mercury until it fled and left behind a skin of light. The only thing she added, but what came after that I forgot. What she spent a lifetime forgetting could be my subject. The fenced in small towns of Leinster, the coastal villages where the language of the sea was handed on. Phases bruised by storms, by shipwrecks, but isn't. My subject is the part, wishing plays in the way villages are made to vanish, in the way I learned to separate memory from knowledge. So one was volatile, one was not. And how I started writing, burning light, building heat, until all at once I was the fire gilder ready to lay radiance down, ready to decorate. It happened with, it never did. When all at once I remember what it was she said. The only thing is, it is extremely dangerous. So that poem got me to thinking about my art conservation classes, which I had taken many moons ago while attending University College Dublin in, in the 80s. Nessa, you might re recognize the context for this poem. It's called Silver Point, my homage um, to <laughs> a very humble homage. Art conservation classes took place in the Tempietto, a pillar gym hidden behind the modernist brute of an arts block. Every Thursday, a dedicated few of us headed over there to learn the methods of great masters. Great mistresses did not figure yet in the grand canon. We learned how Giotto's frescoes were made one square at a time, reassuring to hear how a masterpiece can be broken down into so many days hard work, each one a girnato. We made tempera from brilliant yellow egg yolk saw how it produced the most luminous of surfaces for the Arnolfini brothers. I saw the difference between engravings, woodcuts, etchings, came to recognize the beauty of a bird line fading as the plate aged and learned the meaning of exotic terms like pentimento and palimpsest. But it was silver point that took my breath the softness of the line I drew across the treated plate. I looked to Leonardo to be my guide, sensing his understanding of the feminine. My attempts to copy Head of the Virgin looked clumsy to my eye, but my classmates gathered round and said, I'd really got it. With seeming ease, my hand formed the outline of her head, silver mixed with zinc transforming student marks into fine lines. My youthful hope, by immersion in the work of masters, some genius might rub off. At the end of third semester, we each took one piece home. 
It was 1984, the year when a girl whose name echoed mine died with her newborn child at the feet of a plaster virgin in a field in Granard. When we left the flat for summer, I binned my precious, precious silver point in an ochre yellow skip. All faith had fled. Society and history had me convinced I'd never measure up. So thank you, Evan, for prompting that one. Thank you so much for joining us from Sligo. I appreciate you being here today. And again, I love, I love, I, 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 I love that um, actually hearing the poem of Evans that influences your own poem. I it, mean, it does get a context, I think. Yeah, it's so perfect. And um, it's it giving me an idea for another format mm. for cultivating voices somewhere down the line of, you know. I, I, I also just wanted to say, I, I did hear Evan recite Quarantine in 2015 in the Presbyterian Church in Sligo. And it was, it was, you could hear a pin drop and it was, it was really a turning point as was my participation in her workshop of that year. And I still have my notes from that very, very significant couple of hours that I just had the privilege to take part in. And it's very precious to me. So she had such an influence on, yeah, how many people? It's huge. Huh? And, you know, today, like today is, is you're right, is like, is a sliver of the influence, right? It, it's like, it's like the it's like the stone in the pond and the ripple, like just the ripple, like the just the amazing ripples um, from from one from one human being in history, um, and and may we never underestimate that about ourselves as well, and mm. our and our writing as well. Thank you mm. so much, and I'll see you soon. I hope. <laughs> All right, we're going to end today um, and I will come back with some, just a few remarks, but we wanted to share with you um, Ivan reading one of her own poems. Um, it is the final poem in The Historians uh, that Marian gave me. And uh, uh, it is our, future will become the past of other women. I should mention just about this poem before um, Kim cues this up, that Ivan is reading this poem uh, for a United Nations event to, the poem itself was commissioned by the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations and the Royal Irish Academy to mark the centenary of Irish women exercising their right to vote in 1918. So here it is, we come, we circle right back to history and women and their voices. So thank you, Kim, and thank you, Yvonne. Hi everyone, I'm going to take a moment and share my screen and I will then um, uh, queue up the film. Sandy, can you give me a quick uh, I should start here by Oral saying thumbs how up, if all is well. I am to be in this building. Uh, my father was, of course, uh, involved here. He was a diplomat here. I was a child when I came here. But I remembered all my life his profound and passionate sense of the honor of having been here as a United Nations diplomat and all that goes on here that makes things go better into the future. I have some very brief thanks to make, but I, I really want to make them. First of all, to thank the 
uh, president of the General Assembly, is a fellow poet, and um, thank her so much for her hospitality today and also to be so glad to be here with the minister. Um, the thanks I particularly want to make uh, to Geraldine Bernays and the ambassador, who really was a, a wonderful partner in this, and to Owen Maxweeney, who, who helped so much with it. You know, when I wrote this poem, this is a public poem, but it's a poem that contains a huge amount of stakeholding of people in Ireland and a huge amount of their will that, that these people be honored. And that made it a privilege for me as a poet. I want to thank the Royal Irish Academy, Porrick Dempsey, and Ruth Hegarty, who uh, brought this forward and, and, of course, generated the absolutely beautiful book that came of it. Fidel Maslattery, who is the uh, designer, and Paula McGlynn, who, who's with us today. It's very rare that a poet has the privilege of such visualization of a poem. And finally, my thanks today are to the suffragettes named in this poem. They are people who lived in a time when Ireland discussed its freedom, but didn't always include their vision of it. And some of their lives were lived in loneliness and doubt and disparagement, and they persisted. I have two daughters and two granddaughters, and they owe some of their future to those women, and I was extraordinarily honored to be involved in this. Um, I just want one tiny little piece of guidance on the first paragraph of the poem. It's not about a suffragette, but I wanted to do it. It's about the women of the 19th century, the early hard part of it, the late 18th, who never voted, who never got the chance to see themselves become citizens of the ballot box, but were the grandmothers and great-grandmothers of the women who did. This is called Our Future Will Become the Past of Other Women. Show me your hand, I see our past. Your palm roughened by heat, by frost, by pulling a crop out of the earth, by lifting a cauldron off the hearth, by stripping rushes dipped in fat to make a wick, make a rush light. That was your world, your entry to our ancestry in our darkest century. Ghost sufferer, our ghost sister, remind us now again that history changes in one moment with one mind, that it belongs to us, to all of us. And as we mark these hundred years, we will not leave you behind. No one is left behind or should be as we honor this centenary. A hundred years ago, a woman's vote becoming law became the right of Irish women. And we remember them as we celebrate this freedom. But freedom is not abstract, is not a concept, is not an ethic only, nor a precept. It can also be a hope, raised and then defeated, and then renewed. It can be a voice braided into the silences of other women who came before. Today, we note the achievement of Irish suffragettes, and as we mark the law, the act, the vote, we honor also their years of doubt, their years of work. Today, we offer to those women our thanks, and here we say some of their names to honor all of their names. Louis Bennett, Sissica Hallen, Helen Chevenix, Charlotte Despard, Louise Gavin Duffy, Eva Gore Booth, Anna Haslam, Kathleen Lynn, Mary McSweeney, Helena Maloney, Florence Moon, Sarah Purse, Constance Markiewicz, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, Isabel Todd Hunter, and Jenny Wise Power. And now, if you will, imagine those women gathering one by one in Irish cities late in 1918 in a cold winter. Each of them ready to enter history, each of them called to their duties as citizens to exercise a hard-won right, a franchise. 
They vote in the shadow of their past. They vote in the light of what will be their new nation, whose quest for freedom speaks to their own. If we could only summon them, those women, foremothers of the nurture and dignity that will come to all of us from this day, we could say across the century to each one, give me your hand, it has written our future. Our future will become the past of other women. Our island that was once settled and removed on the edge of Europe is now a bridge to the world. And now we share this day with women everywhere for those who find the rights they need to be hard won, to be not guaranteed, and not easily given for each one of them. We have a gift today, a talisman, the memory of these Irish women who struggled and prevailed, for whose sake we choose these things from their date to honor, to remember, and to celebrate. All those who called for it, the vote for women. All those who had the faith that voices can be raised and can be heard. All those who saw their hopes become the law. All those who woke in a new state, flowering from an old nation and found justice no longer blind, inequity set aside and freedom redefined. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, you've just heard from Van Boland, from her poem, final poem in her final collection, The Historians. There it is. I keep showing it because I want you all to buy it. So you have it. Our future will become the past of other women. Thank you for joining us today to honor this really incredible woman, poet, historian, humanitarian, Ivan Boland. And please help me in giving your gratitude to our special guests today, Catherine Ann Cullen, from Poetry Ireland, poet in residence at Poetry Ireland. Jesse Lendeni, founder and managing editor of Salmon Poetry. Jesse wants me to always say it, my Salmon sister, Rachel Hegarty. And my other Salmon sister, Nessa O'Mahony, author of Ivan Boland, Inside History. And to all of our poets from the open mic, we heard today from Ray Ball, Marcella Raymond, Bertha Rogers, Patrick Lodge, Susanna Case, Rosaline Callahan, Ahmed Dahiyabadsha, and Marion Lovett. Everyone, it was everything I could have hoped for to bring us together today um, in tribute to Ivan Boland. I hope you will also consider joining me this Sunday for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry's first reading of May. It's our poet's focus on the theme of May Day with guest host Angela Driven, featuring poets Catherine O'Regan from Cork, from the UK, poet and labor historian, Tim Evans from just north of here in Western Washington, Dana Patterson. And joining us back from today will be Rachel Hegarty reading from May Day, 1974. You will not want to miss this prismatic reading on the theme of May Day with an open mic for you to bring your own poems forth. May will also bring us quite a few other very 
incredible readings, um, two book showcases, new book showcases. We'll bring the voices of Crystal Stone, Ray Johnson, Martina McGowan, Pratibha Castle, Risa Denenberg, Kelly Russell Agadin, Diane Zeus, and Mancho Alvarado. And May 16th, you will not want to miss our poet's focus on the theme of witness, a conversation in three generations with Janice Miritikani, former poet laureate of San Francisco, Mary Oishi, current poet laureate of Albuquerque, and Tanya Kohong, the author of The War From Within. Well, we will end May sort of where we some of started today. We will be celebrating the 40th anniversary of Salmon Poetry with our Salmon Poetry, 40 at 40, 40 Salmon Poets, each reading a poem to celebrate the 40th anniversary. We thought April was Poetry Month. Well, May is also Poetry Month at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Thanks to Don, Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons for your dedication to curating this event today and every event for the love of poetry and gratitude and peace and wellness to all of you from wherever you're joining us today. Until next time, my friends, safe travels and keep writing. And finally, rest in poetry's power Evan Boland, and good night to you all. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs>